Hello, welcome. Today we would start with the 12th chapter for G.C. Leong and in this chapter we would focus on oceans and oceanography. Now when we talk about oceans, there is kind of circulation that occurs in the ocean surface as well as the deep waters. Let's first understand this process of circulation. We have a kind of a bowl here with an ice cube and what I do is I just pour some drops of color close to the ice cube and as you can see the lower sections you have a kind of convention uh, convection current that is seen and this ice uh, this color slowly and gradually spreads downwards from the ice cube and it would spread in the lower surface or the deep waters as we can see in the real world in the oceans and finally you would have a kind of complete circulation that would be seen. So that is the process that occurs because of the temperature gradient in this case. Now this similar process can occur because of the salinity differences. So we would be understanding the temperature variations, the salinity variations and uh, we would be focusing on the thermohaline circulation which we have already covered in detail in one of the other lectures. So before we start with all this, let's first have a general introduction about oceans. Now this chapter is a kind of huge summary of the whole concept of oceanography bringing amidst the various aspects, the topography, the depositions, the circulation patterns, the currents and so on within one chapter. So we'll start with the exploration of oceans. Now exploration of oceans started with various mechanisms. It is mainly through the eco devices you have that, that the deep waters are understood and we try to understand the process of the relief features that are seen in the bottom topography of the ocean surface. Similarly, to study this, you had a challenger, challenger as one of the deep sea expeditions that took place initially. Then you have numerous research institutes. One of the famous research institute is the Indian Oceanography Research Center with its headquarters at Copenhagen. So all these institutions are basically involved in understanding the features and the processes that occur in the oceans. Now oceans as we know comprise of nearly three-fourths of the earth's surface and therefore since it's a kind of huge mass that it forms we need to understand this very carefully. The first topic that we would start today with is the ocean relief. Now similar to the relief that we see in the real world that's the mountains, plateaus, plains and valleys we have a similar feature that exists below the surface of the ocean. We have again a detailed lecture on each of these so you can definitely go through that. Now coming on to the components of the ocean topography. The first component that we will talk about today is the continental shelf. As the name suggests, it is very close to the continent or the landmass. So close to the landmass, you have continental shelf. Now this continental shelf can be broad in certain places and could be less broad or small in other places. So let's say in chapter 9 we, when we talked about the various coastal landforms, we talked about cliffs and wave cut platform. So if there is a cliff or a wave cut platform what would happen? The slope would be very steep and therefore the continental shelf would not be that broad. In other cases where you have more beach formations and other uh, spread out effects, you can say the continental shelf would be much broad. The areas where you have broad continental shelf are the best areas for fishing activities. So you have the Newfoundland, you have the Dogger Banks, you have the Grand Banks. So all these are example of excellent fishing grounds, the reason being in this region of continental shelf, you have abundant planktons that are seen and because of the planktons that are seen in this region, you have numerous fishes that thrive here. The next to the continental shelf, you have continental slope. Generally slope is marked by a kind of 1 is to 20 degrees ratio and what is happening here is it's basically previously it was thought that this continental slope is a kind of featureless area 
but with more studies you can now see trenches basins that are form or that are part of the ocean slope or the continental slope and finally you have the ocean deep which is also known as the abyssal plains now these ocean deep areas or the abyssal plain areas are the areas where you have huge amount of clay deposition now this we would talk as we move further in the region of in the section on deposits so this abyssal plain would have trenches or small valleys and these could be big valleys as well so these valleys that are present here are known as trenches and trenches again form the part of the ocean deep you have numerous trenches that are seen kuril trench you have japan japan trench so these are some of the common trenches that you have heard now near the philippines you heard have minenando trench and then you have the marena trench which is considered as one of the biggest trench now coming on to the next topic that is ocean deposits as we saw you have the ocean surface now definitely when you are having a ocean surface there would be some kind of deposition that would be seen we classify this deposition under three heads that is the mud ooze and clay now clay we'll understand at first clay is the most simplest one so what happens over the surface of earth we see volcanic activities and you have the lava flow similarly the volcanoes that are taking place below the ocean or within the ocean surface and they are erupting within the ocean you have huge amount of volcanic dust that is deposited and therefore we say the ocean bottom has red clay deposits which basically has its origin from the volcanic dust so one that is clay is already covered the next is oozes oozes are the remains of skeletal animals and it can be either calcium deposit or silica deposit so it can be calcareous in nature or siliceous in nature so those are oozes the next is mud now mud is found as a result of terrigenous deposits that's coming from the land it could be blue green or red and it depends on the chemical constituent of the material that's seen in that region and that governs the color of the mud so that is the mud is a result of terrigenous deposits coming from the land so we talked about firstly the ocean relief secondly the deposits coming on to the next is salinity <clears throat> we have a detailed lecture on salinity temperature and thermohaline circulation so for if you want to go into more details you must go through those lectures now coming on to salinity salinity we say if we look on to the ocean bottom 77% of the ocean bottom salt constituents are common salt or sodium chloride however besides sodium you can see chlorides of magnesium potassium calcium but those are found in less or trace amount as compared to the sodium deposits or the sodium chloride the next important thing is the lines that join the places of equal salinity are now known as isohaline similarly you have isobath where you talk about the same depth so those are the various iso means equal so basically isohaline means lines joining equal salinity again the salinity varies or is governed by numerous features for example if the rate of evaporation is too high salinity would increase but on the other hand if you have lot of water that is mixing in or lot of rivers or streams that are draining into the region the salinity would decrease because you have fresh water intake that is coming up so salinity is governed again by the current flow the wind direction so those we would discuss in a while when we would talk about circulations in detail so those are the parameters that govern salinity so we can say salinity of baltic sea is less because of the uh, mixing up of fresh water however on the other hand salinity in dead sea and lake van is much higher now these high salinity make them a perfect place for beginners to learn swimming because due to high salinity you have 
uh, most of the people who are trying to learn swimming there would float and sinking becomes very difficult and therefore these are called as the optimum places for the beginners to learn swimming because there is no probability of drowning in the waters. The next important thing that we would try to understand is the factors that we have talked about but besides this factor there is one interesting thing and that is the variation across the globe now what would happen towards the pole and the equator so let's say this is the pole zero uh, 90 degree and you have zero degree so what would happen across the poles and the equator at the equator you would have a lot of influx of rainwater uh, and rainfall and therefore the salinity would be lower what would happen in the poles? In the poles, the phenomena would be much more interesting because in the poles, you would have ice formation and during the process of ice formation, ice is usually formed as a kind of pure uh, H2O and therefore, you would have the salt component that is rejected, which is also known as brine rejection. As a result, you would have ice formations towards the polar area and the brine would be rejected which would go down into the lower layers. So the salinity in the polar regions and the equatorial regions is comparatively less to the subtropical region. Now subtropical region, predominantly the western coast have deserts as we have seen in the previous lectures. Now since the western regions of the continents have desert, as you can see Sahara Desert, you can see Atacama Desert and so on. So these sites have desert, as a result you would have high temperature, low humidity and high rate of evaporation ultimately leading to higher salinity. So if you look onto this graph carefully, you would see the polar latitude, the equator and the subtropic the subtropic has the highest level of salinity amongst the three. Uh, however, we again talk of one very interesting phenomena that is variation with depth. Upper few meters of the ocean have the surface flow and this surface flow is mainly governed by changes in temperature. However, in the lower layers, the major variation is due to salinity. Now as you can see in this diagram, in the deeper layers you would have the salinity in all the three regions, the equator pole and the subtropic that varies. Now let's quickly move to the diagram for the temperature. Now for the same diagram, you have temperature that is taken into account and as you can see in the lower layers or deeper waters, you have the salinity sorry the temperature that remains constant for the polar area as well as the equatorial area so in the lower areas we do not find the circulation patterns due to the changes in the temperature however in the surface layers that's the ocean currents that we talk about we have variations in the temperature and therefore we talk about warm current cold current however in the lower layers or the deep ocean waters where we would understand in a while you would have the circulation that's predominantly due to salinity and therefore the ocean water circulation is known as thermohaline circulation. Thermo means temperature, haline means salinity and a combination of temperature and salinity leads to circulation of ocean waters. Now coming on to temperature, that's the second important thing that we try to understand for this lecture. Now this is a diagram that shows a variation of temperature as well as a variation of salinity. Coming on to temperature, definitely you would have lower temperature towards the pole and higher temperature towards the equatorial region. So that's a kind of common variation that you can understand to work around the temperature changes. So temperature changes are more or less direct to understand what happens towards the polar areas as the ice melt or the region gets warmer, you would have the surface temperature that would rise and the circulation patterns that would start. Now whenever we talk about circulation that takes place, it is governed by various reasons. This circulation or what we say the circulation of the ocean currents is due to firstly the planetary winds 
or the uh, and the westerlies so planetary winds which are the kind of permanent winds that are seen in those region, regions are uh, the first one that affect the movement of ocean currents the next important factor that affects the movement of ocean current is the variation in temperature and variation in salinity as you can see again in this diagram. So this diagram shows only the surface layers and in the surface layers we can see how you have the variation of the salinity and the variation of the temperature that is seen. Now one very important understanding of this concept is a variation of the earth's rotation and gravity and land mass also affects the movement of current. When we would discuss the ocean currents, we would understand that the region that this is the Atlantic Ocean and this is the Pacific Ocean. The region of Atlantic Ocean is comparatively more saltier as compared to the Pacific Ocean. Now let's first understand a simple reason for this. A simple reason if I put up to understand this is if we talk about this is the Atlantic Ocean now this is the Rockies range and the Indies mountain range these are bigger mountains there are no such loftier or bigger mountains that are seen on the east of United States now what happens when the water vapor transport uh, tra transportation takes place this water vapor which is getting transported hits the Rockies and therefore it falls there itself so you have rainfall in this region and the Pacific region gets a fresh water. Again the winds that are blowing here try to hit on the regions of Central America and you have the fresh water precipitation that takes place. As a result most of the fresh water influx is on the west side of United States and the east side remains saltier. That's the first thing to understand. So we understood what happens in the northern Atlantic region. Now again why there is higher saltiness in the lower Atlantic region. There are various currents that we would understand in a while but there is one important current which is known as the Antarctic Circumpolar Current that runs west to east. Now this Antarctic Circumpolar Current is a unique current because it runs below 60 degrees south where you actually do not have any big landmass that hinders its movement and it uh, covers the whole of the uh, region uh, around the Antarctic. So this would mix the waters of Pacific Ocean, Atlantic Ocean and Indian Ocean in a summary. Now what happens is you have the Agalis warm current that runs through the east coast of Africa and similarly you have a Mozambique current that runs. Most of the waters of Egolus current take a loop here to complete the circulation patterns in the Indian Ocean. However, while moving through the lower edges, the salinity remains in this region. Now this salinity is taken up by the current that goes and mixes into the Atlantic Ocean. And this point where this current leaks out is known as the Agolus leakage. So Agolus leakage is one of the regions where you have mixing of the salinity from Indian Ocean to Atlantic Ocean and because of this leakage you have higher salinity in the South Atlantic Ocean. Secondly, what happens is you have Indonesian throw flow. Now what happens in the Indonesian sea throw flow? This is the Indonesian sea and you have the current that goes into Pacific Ocean However, a part of it enters into Indian Ocean through the Indonesian sea through flows and therefore you have mixing of waters that takes place between the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean and finally you have the mixing of water that takes place between Indian Ocean and Atlantic Ocean where it releases most of its salinity. So this is how we try to understand a kind of linkages between the three oceans that exist. Now I have two or three questions for you to ponder over or understand. The first question is what would be the scenario if this would be a single landmass? If this would be a single landmass the Indonesian's through flow would not take place and the process of mixing of salinity would vary. That's the first thing. The second thing is 
the antarctic circumpolar current is the region where you have ice sheets if these ice sheets are not present what would be the scenario if this ice sheets are not present there would be no salinity mixing from the indian ocean to the south atlantic ocean and it would again affect the level of salinity in the south atlantic ocean the third important question is what would happen if there are no rockies and no andy mount andes mountains so this was or this has been proved by the researches done in the oregon state university and the uh, state of oregon where you had computer simulation models that were drawn and with those simulation models it was revealed clearly that if there are no bigger mountains on this chain uh, this uh, west side of americas the level of saltiness in the pacific ocean would be much higher as compared to that of the atlantic ocean so those are some of the important things to understand now we would quickly move on to one of the video captures from nasa and this would help you understand the concept very well now here what we see is the movement of the gulf stream and the movement of the current in the atlantic waters now as it moves towards the north it mixes with the labrador and the east a uh, greenland current which is also known as the irminger current and as you can see these arrows these arrows are the north atlantic deep waters these arrows show the surface waters but these arrow which are going down show the deep waters so you have circulation in the surface waters as well as the deep waters that take place and when it moves from the north atlantic deep waters it goes down to the south atlantic deep water and it forms a kind of s eight shaped pattern where we can say in the north hemisphere it's clockwise in the south hemisphere it's anti clockwise that's simply due to the coriolis effect and then <clears throat> it merges with the antarctic circumpolar current that basically moves around whole of the antarctica and mixes the water so this antarctic circumpolar current goes and forms a loop in the indian ocean and then it again moves and from below the region of australia it goes into the pacific ocean and creates another circulation with you with the uh, indonesian sea through flow that could be seen here so this is a kind of quick demonstration to help you understand the circulation patterns that exist in on the surface water and a deep water so that was basically to bring into picture the impact on the surface currents as well as the deep currents now we will be talking about about the movements of the currents in the three oceans predominantly that's the pacific ocean atlantic ocean and the indian ocean so let's first start with the atlantic ocean so as you can see in this diagram this is the region of atlantic ocean in the north you have the gulf stream that we have already talked about which is a warm stream it mixes with the cold current of labrador in east greenland east greenland current is also known as irminger current so these two cold current meet with the uh, gulf stream and the region where you have the mixing of cold current and warm current are the regions of best fishing grounds and the region with abundant planktons so you have the best fishing grounds like grand banks jogger banks that are located in this region then it completes its circulation with the canary current which is a cold current running from the european region counterpart to the canary current in the north atlantic waters you have benigüela current in the south atlantic waters which is again a cold current and in the south you can see a kind of anti clockwise circulation that is seen on the uh, east of the south america you have brazilian current that flows through so the south is anti clockwise circulation the north is a clockwise circulation the same would happen in the pacific and the indian oceans as well the next is coming on to the pacific ocean in the pacific ocean in the south pacific you have peru current which is a cold current which is also known as the humboldt current and it completes its circulation with the south equatorial and south pacific merging with the east australian current which is a warm current so you would have a kind of circulation with warm waters and cold waters that runs through now this circulation is being completed in the south hemisphere 
and as you can see this south pacific is being drained by the uh, antarctic circumpolar current the next is the region of north hemisphere uh, north pacific in the north pacific on the west of united states you have california which is californian current which is a cold current that runs here and completes through the kuroshimo which is a warm current running parallel to japan and is also known as the japan current this kuroshimo current mixes with the oyashio current and the ostrov current which two are the cold currents and again this becomes one of the major fishing grounds so you have lot of fishing activities that are seen in this region and finally you have the north pacific and the uh, cycle uh, completes in the north pacific now as we saw in the atlantic in the pacific also northern regions you have clockwise circulation in the southern regions you have anti clockwise circulation the next important thing is in the equatorial in the mid atlantic region you can see there is not much uh, activity that is seen in terms of the plankton growth because the waters are more or less constant here and therefore you do not have much uh, Uh, significant plankton activity that is registered coming on to the last that is the indian ocean in the indian ocean you have mozambique warm waters and agolus waters that we have already talked about how agolus leakage mixes with the south atlantic ocean and makes the south atlantic ocean much saltier as compared to the pacific ocean so this circulation and agolus leakage affects this region and then you have the two circulations that are seen in the indian ocean this is the south indian ocean circulation where, which completes with west australia and then you have the north indian ocean circulation the north indian uh, ocean circulation is interesting because it's affected by the monsoon winds so it's affected by the seasonal reversal of monsoon winds the southwest monsoons and the northeast monsoons that we would discuss more in the chapters on climatology for now we have covered the basics of the oceanography we have covered the topography we have talked about the deposits the variation with temperature and salinity and how ocean currents runs now some of the important currents could be directly part of your question there could be questions on which of the following are warm currents cold currents the places where the warm current and the cold currents meet so those are some of the important questions the alternate names for example peru current is also known as humboldt current east greenland is known as irminger current and so on so with this we cover the chapter on oceanography and oceans in the next two classes we would be talking about climatology and those would again be very comprehensive classes so stay tuned do subscribe to the channel if you have any questions leave those as comment below the video have a very good day ahead